All right, our final speaker for this session is uh, Dr. Philip Moore. And Dr. Moore is a soil scientist with USDA ARS located in Fayetteville, Arkansas. The razor match, right? No. Yes, okay. Uh, his research primarily focuses on uh, developing best management practices that reduce phosphorus runoff and ammonia emissions from animal manure. Uh, Dr. Moore has uh, 12 patents on technology used to reduce air and water pollution and two pending patents, including one that he's going to talk about in his te technology as he discusses today in his speech. So, Dr. Moore. Thanks, Jeff. And I'm going to start calling you every afternoon because you got so much energy that it'll wake me up, man. That's great. But I'm starting five minutes late, so you're not yeah, going to dock me lately. No, no, no docking. All right. So, I'm going to talk about uh, using acid tolerant nitrifying bacteria to generate the acidity needed to operate ammonia scrubbers in uh, poultry and swine facilities. <clears throat> According to the EPA, the biggest source of atmospheric ammonia in the U.S. is animal manure, and poultry manure supposedly makes up about 27 percent of that total. We found that over half of the nitrogen, over half of the nitrogen excreted from broiler chickens is lost to the atmosphere before that manure is ever removed from the barns. Uh, that's a huge waste. And uh, the ammonia emission factor for 50-day-old broilers was about 46 grams per bird. So a good rule of thumb, about a tenth of a pound per bird. In Arkansas, we grow over a billion chickens. So that means there's over a hundred million pounds of ammonia being lost uh, to the atmosphere. And that represents a huge waste of a very important natural resource. You know, uh, nitrogen is the number one element needed for, uh, for crop production. Well, when you get it in the atmosphere, nitrogen ends up in lakes and rivers, and it contributes to eutrophication in the same way as nitrogen from runoff. In fact, in some areas where you have a lot of ammonia, it, it really is overwhelming compared to how much you're getting from just runoff. Uh, and then when that ammonia gets in the air, it reacts with NOx and SOx compounds, makes really fine ammonium nitrate, ammonium sulfate particles, which can really cause uh, problems to the elderly and the young uh, when in health. Then when it's deposited to the ground, what happens? It's nitrified. And nitrification, nitrification is an acid forming reaction. Uh, in Holland, back in the 1980s, their national forests started dying. And they said, oh, it's acid rain, you know, it's soil acidification. They figure it's all acid rain. Well, about 50% of that acidity was due to ammonia deposition and subsequent nitrification. And that was coming, 85% of that was coming from uh, animal manure. Well, currently, the only technology used in the U.S. to control ammonia emissions from, from chicken houses is adding acids like aluminum sulfate or sodium bisulfate. But in Europe, they use another technology in that they use these scrubbers, uh, acid scrubbers, to capture this ammonia. With the acid scrubbers, uh, this exhaust air from the barn is, is passed through a reactor and you're spraying acid in there and you shift the ammonia from the gas phase to the liquid phase. They also remove odors and dust from the air. Uh, the Dutch scrubbers are great. They have like 30% removal efficiency for odor and 90% uh, removal for uh, 60 to 90 percent for, for PM10. Uh, they're very, very effective uh, for uh, ammonia. It's like 90 percent plus, but they're very expensive, about a quarter million dollars per house. Uh, that, that's pretty expensive. They use sulfuric acid, and so the farmers aren't the ones dealing with it because it's concentrated sulfuric that's trucked to the farm. You have a company doing that, and then they're trucking off the, the product. Almost all of the scrubbers in Holland, just about all of them, are on swine farms. And the reason for that is they can't do them on poultry farms because poultry creates a lot of dust and that dust clogs up their, uh, their systems, their packing material in their scrubbers. And so the goal of our research on acid scrubbers has been to develop a scrubber that can handle really, really low, uh, heavy loadings, dust loadings, without clogging. Uh, and that's, that's what you get in, in poultry. And we were, we were willing to sacrifice some of our efficiency. We don't have to have 90%. If we can, if we can hit 50%, I'm happy with that. But we just can't have a system that clogs. 
Another goal was to develop a scrubber that was both simple and safe enough to, to use that any poultry drawer could do it. Okay, and then in a perfect world, it's going to be cost effective to operate. You know, that's the tough one right there. Well, in Arkansas, in some watersheds, growers can't apply litter because we have soil test threshold, soil test phosphorus thresholds, is 300 pound per acre soil test threshold, above which they can't apply manure, so they have to go out and buy nitrogen fertilizers for their pastures or row crops. If we could develop a scrubber that just caught five pounds of nitrogen per day, uh, then a grower could recover about 1,825 pounds of nitrogen per year. Now, if he had a couple on each chicken house, and in Arkansas, the typical farm has four chicken houses, if you have four chicken houses, then he could recover about 15,000 pounds of nitrogen per year. Typical uh, Arkansas farm has about 100 acres. That would be enough nitrogen for 150 pounds of nitrogen per acre. You would make all your nitrogen needs uh, for your crop, and of course, air and water quality would really benefit. We've been working on scrubbers for about a decade now. Uh, I've got a couple patents on them, and the current version uh, has this, uh, it's a dust scrubber uh, first, and then ammonia scrubber. You gotta get the dust out of the air. Uh, poultry litter has very high alkalinity, and if you don't get that dust out of the air, then you're wasting your acid neutralizing uh, that dust. Uh, these shells are made out of fiberglass, and each one has a 360 uh, liter reservoir in the bottom. And we've made ours, we focused on minimum vent. Because that's the big thing the Dutch said, uh, is you get your biggest bang for the buck trying to do the minimum ventilation fans. And we've stayed away from the tunnel fans. We have uh, eight rows of wooden slats, at, uh, uh, of 11 wooden slats. They're at 45 degree angles. Then we have a feather trap on the dust scrubber, and, and that's used to catch feathers and, uh, and large particulate matter so it doesn't clog up our pump down inside there. And so basically, if you've got the chicken house over here and the exhaust air goes through here, we have uh, a reservoir and we're recycling this water in there. These are the wooden slats. It's a little feather trap. And then it goes into the acid scrubber. We're doing the same thing with acids. We're making little acid curtains. And then originally, we put this cool cell material on. We, you know, I was working with Robert Burns. I don't know if any of you guys know him. He's a very stubborn man. And we argued about that. I said, man, it's going to clog just like the Dutch scrubbers are clogging. He's, no, no, Philip, you're taking care of all the dust. Well, we're doing a pretty good job on the dust. We're not taking care of all of it. And I said, this is going to clog. And sure enough, we had that thing on there for about three or four weeks on a real chicken house, and it clogged up. So we, we've gotten rid of that. Uh, uh, we're no longer using that. We're just we're going with the slats. So currently, studies are underway uh, to evaluate these uh, scrubbers and commercial boiler farms in Arkansas, Delaware, and Pennsylvania. We've used several different types of acid, um, uh, sodium bisulfate, which is sold under the trade name PLT, poultry litter treatment. We used alum, uh, we used sulfuric acid, and this work's funded by a conservation innovation grant from NRCS that uh, Dr. Hong Lee uh, from University of Delaware wrote. And we're, the objectives are to evaluate the effectiveness of the scrubbers in reducing ammonia dust and odors from exhaust air or chicken houses, determine how much nitrogen is captured, then try to figure out the amount of acid, electricity, water, and labor needed to operate it, and, and determine the cost effectiveness of the scrubber. We found it uses uh, about 554 kilowatt hours per scrubber per flock, about 27 bucks worth of electricity, and, and about 1,000 gallons of water, uh, and that's through evaporation. This is some of the ammonia capturing efficiency, and here we have our different runs, some of them 12, 24, 48 hours. <coughs> to get the mass going in, we're measuring the ventilation rate, and we're measuring real-time uh, ammonia concentrations in the air. It gets the mass in, and then the mass coming out, we just measure the concentration in the reservoir. We know the volume, and so we can get the mass. And then uh, we can get our efficiency from that, and you see it vary uh, from 38 to 77 uh, percent. And so on, on average, the efficiency of capture wasn't too bad. It's about 55%. But if you look at the cost effectiveness, it's ugly. It's really bad. The average amount of nitrogen caught with a 50-pound bag of PLT was about 3 kilograms or 6.64 pounds. And that bag costs $15.50. So that's equivalent to $2.33 per pound of nitrogen. And that doesn't include the price of the scrubber, which is like $10,000. 
the cost of electricity, the cost of water, and of course the labor to operate it. Poultry production is not affected by this because you're cleaning the air that's leaving the house, not what's going in, you know. So the only benefit you're getting is that nitrogen. And nitrogen's cheap, relatively cheap. When you go to the co-op, you can buy nitrogen in Fayetteville, Arkansas for a dollar pound of nitrogen. You know, cheaper if you buy it in bulk. I think, and this is my opinion, the economics of using any kind of acid to capture ammonia from chicken houses is questionable. Uh, particularly since the scrubbers themselves are so expensive. Everybody says, well, Philip, go to sulfuric. Sulfuric acid poses a significant safety risk when used by typical growers. And, and it's not cheap in small quantities. You know, we're, we're buying 30 gallon drums and, uh, you know, that's a pretty heavy drum, you know. And at that, it's 10 to $15 a gallon. And at that price, if you look at the cost per mole of acid, it's the same thing as alum or PLT. It's not any cheaper. You have to get a semi of acid for it to be a dollar a gallon. And not many farmers want to have a semi of sulfuric acid come to their farm, you know. And so we looked at free acids for this, but they're waste acids and they're often contaminated with some junk. And then even shipping that is questionable, you know, you're, you're shipping water. And so we decided to try to do a, make a biological system where the bacteria provide the acid needed to capture ammonia. And of course, nitrification was the obvious choice. Uh, we're all familiar with nitrification, that's where ammonium is converted to nitrate. And for every mole of ammonium, you get two moles of hydrogen ions formed. And so we hypothesized that a system could be developed using ammonia oxidizing bacteria, uh, proteobacteria, nitrous ammonis, nitrococcus to generate the acid needed to capture ammonia. The scrubbers, and the idea was, if every mole of ammonia we caught resulted in two moles of acid, and that acid caught more ammonia, which was nitrified, and the cycle kept repeating itself, then we would have our free acid source. Well, there's a problem with that. The bugs that the, the do, the organisms that, that <coughs> nitrify, don't work below in acid conditions below about pH 6.5. You know, and in our scrubbers, we need pretty acidic conditions, so it needs to be below about pH 4.5 for them to be really efficient. So we needed to develop a acid tolerant nitrifying bacteria. So in order to do this, we built a, a, a reactor in the lab, and we went uh, to the Rogers Wastewater Treatment Plant, and we got some sewage sludge, or biosolids, whatever you want to call it, from their aeration basin, our, our, our nitrification base. And then we put that into this reactor and we fed it a solution of ammonium chloride. And that ammonium, of course, is potential acidity, you know, when it's uh, nitrified. So we put sodium bicarbonate in there with it as a base. We had a one-to-one -one mole ratio of potential acidity to base. And we started running that thing. We had to give them oxygen. You know, these bugs have to breathe and everything. They're respiring, so we're giving them oxygen. And then we're measuring ammonium, nitrate, and pH in the effluent of this thing. And when they nitrify all the ammonium, they start really kicking, then we increase the ammonium chloride. And we increase it, and we increase it. We have really high rates of nitrification all this ammonium chloride. Now. Well then, we start changing that mole mo ratio of ammonium chloride to sodium bicarbonate to 0 0.995, 0 0.99. And we're dropping the amount of base in there. So it gets acid. And with time, we get it more and more acidic until their bugs are in very acidic conditions. And, and, and th at that point, they become acid tolerant. So this is our little system we had uh, where we put filter light, it's like exploded vermiculite in here. And we're pumping this in a circle, feeding the ammonium chloride in here. And then we have an oxygen tank where we're bubbling air through there. And we can measure, we have a little uh, port where we can m measure dissolved oxygen. We want to keep it at 10 parts per million. And, and we were metering this in about seven mils per, per minute. And that's what it looked like in real life, not quite as pretty. Uh, but this is, this is the effluent pH. Now what's going in with that sodium bicarb buffering it is about pH 8.2. And you see right here is where we started uh, decreasing that sodium bicarbonate in there. And you can see that the pH starts really dropping down here. And at the end, we're at pH 4.2. So it's gone from pH 8.2 to pH 4.2. pH is logarithmic. That's four logs 
That's 10,000 times more acidic at pH 4.2. So we go, okay, these bugs are ready. You know, let's take them to the farm. You know, so what we did, we, we got the clay out of there and we, we took it to the farm where we've got these scrubbers and we just put it in cheesecloth and we, we just stapled that cheesecloth to, to the slats. And we didn't know if it was gonna work or not. And, and we only had enough to do three slats out of our 88 slats, you know, but you work with what you got. After a few weeks, we had this beautiful bacterial slime growing. I mean, look at that, it was awesome. <laughs> and for the first time, we started seeing uh, nitrate in very high concentrations in our scrubber and the pH was going down. So we said, let's run with this baby. And we started doing it, and it was one time a year. And uh, look at this nitrogen we're catching. In about 30 days, we're catching uh, 20 kilograms of nitrogen. About half of it's nitrate, about half of it's ammonia. And keep in mind, we just had three slats. You know, all right. We, we were just using three slats there. And, uh, and so if we had like 30 slats with this thing, you know, we should go almost be able to produce like 10 times as much or capture 10 times as much and so we've applied for a patent for this thing and, and again what we're trying to do we're going to have a little nylon uh, mesh things here and try to get those bacteria growing on it uh, so some of our conclusions acid scrubbers can remove ammonia from boiler uh half exhaust air but they're currently not cost effective i didn't really get into this uh i didn't think i'd have enough time we found uh sodium bisulfate uh, is really toxic uh, to plants. We thought there was going to be enough calcium and magnesium in our dust scrubber and all that dust where we mixed them together that the sodium absorption ratio, the ratio of sodium to calcium and magnesium would be low enough to where it wouldn't hurt plants. Well, I was wrong again on that one. It will toast plants, you know. It will kill it dead as a hammer. So we're done with sodium by sulfate. Uh, we're looking at, at sulfuric acid and we're looking at, at alum, you know, and you don't have that same kind of problem. Uh, but when it comes to the economics, sulfuric acid and, and alum aren't any better than, than PLT or sodium the sulfide. Hulch production is not improved when acid scrubbers are used to capture ammonia from chicken houses, so the only economic benefit you're getting is that nitrogen. And again, nitrogen's cheap. Bottom line, it's much easier and more cost effective right now to prevent ammonia emissions from boiler houses using litter amendments like alum than to use scrubbers. Well, future research. These bugs that we developed, these acid tolerant organisms, are, thrive at very warm temperatures. Our little pump in the lab was generating a lot of heat. And it turns out that system that we have is about 85 degrees in there. And that's what those bacteria like, is that really warm water. Well, our scrubbers outside of chicken houses in northwest Arkansas in the wintertime get really cold. I mean, they've frozen over before, right? Uh, and the amount of heat that you would have to put in the system to keep it 85 or 90 degrees, that's not sustainable at all. So we decided our next step, what we're doing right now, is trying to develop a strain of acid tolerant nitrifying bacteria that are also tolerant of, of cold conditions. And so we've set up a lab microcosm uh, just like we did before, only now we've got this great big giant cooler, aquarium cooler, that's hooked to it. And I was talking to Mateus earlier, I didn't even know this until today, that's why these meetings are great. He's already patented a cold tolerant nitrifying bug. So he's going to send me some of his bug. I don't know how that works, if we, you know, if we put that in here, if it's going to be able to be, if we can make that sucker acid tolerant. But I think we can come up with an acid tolerant, uh, uh, cold tolerant bug. And so we're hoping to develop a nitrification enhanced ammonia scrubber that's practical and works here around. However, pause coming. Bacteria are living things, you know, and I found they're really flaky, you know. They die, it's not like, I've been, I used to working with stuff like alum and, and, and you know, you dump alum in with manure, you get, you know, the pH drops and everything happens the same time after time after time. But these are living systems, I think, I'm hoping that a good microbiologist will come along and say, Philip, I want to take this baby and run with it. And, and so we can give it to someone that knows what they're doing as far as keeping these bacteria alive. Hopefully, uh, we can make this work. Thank you. All right, man. Any questions for Dr. Moore? Uh, oh, right over here, Jack Jones. Uh, <coughs> 
So, Philip, uh, thank you for your presentation. My question basically is you predicated on your last few statements, you know, bacteria life things are developing there. Uh, you know, when I hear you, what I'm hearing is you are trying to make them be adaptable to, uh, you know, the conditions that you want, and you're not changing their genetics. Is that in the future where, you know, you knock off genes that, uh, you know, make them not like, uh, or rather, make, make them like, or you, you include genes that make them like acid conditions and include genes in themselves that make them like or tolerate, you know, cold conditions. Is that part of the future, you know, genetic engineering? Well, not for me. You know, I'm a chemist, and so, you know, that, I, I can't go there, you know, I don't, I don't have those skills or anything, but certainly someone else could do that. I mean, you know, I, I think it's definitely possible. Uh, there's a question in the back. Yeah, so um, how does the efficiency of the acid-tolerant nitrifying bacteria compare to the efficiency that you noted with the ala and the sulfate order? Have you not quite reached that? Well, we we actually didn't have the system in place that we have now back when I, I actually did this research with the bugs uh, the initial research about six years ago and just now I applied for the patent so I can just now pre present it in public you know but at that time we didn't have the technology to measure what was going in so I, I don't know I would I would think it was it was probably not as good as using chemicals um, mainly because we just had those three slats, you know. I think if you if you had enough bacteria growing in there, it would work almost just as good. I mean, I you know I'm still shooting for 50 percent or close to it removal efficiency uh, with a biological system. And then real quick, um, what what temperature? I, I'm more familiar with the uh, you know beef side of things and you know what we deal with in Colorado, but. Um, well, you know, what temperature are you dealing with inside of these poultry houses in the right. winter? And have you investigated uh, right. possibly using an in-situ system instead of an yeah. exiting system? Oh, that's an that's a, uh, excellent question. When you put a one-day-old chicken in a house, it has to be 90 degrees in that house. Whether it's 90 degrees outside or 10 degrees outside, it's got to be 90 degrees in that house. And then as the birds develop uh, feathers, you know, the, the temperature in that house can be dropped down, you know, to 70 or whatever. Now, the ideal place for our scrubber would be inside the chicken house, you know, because then you wouldn't have to worry about heating it, and, and we have had them frozen and everything. But the problem is you got to get an integrator or a poultry company that's okay with you putting this. The scrubbers are pretty big, and they're going to take up room in their chicken house where they're growing chickens. And, the, you know, they're in the business of growing chickens, and they're putting up with us doing research on these farms, you know. And so you have to get buy-in from, from the integrator, the poultry integrator. If you can, put the scrubber in the house, it's perfect, because then you're purifying the air of the chickens. So then it's like adding alum or something in the house. You're getting better weight gains and feed conversion and all that kind of stuff uh, along with it. So that, that would be the best case scenario is, is use it, have it in the house somehow. And my technician and I argue about this all the time. He's like, you're wasting your time having the scrubbers outside. And I'm like, yeah, well, you get me permission to take up a big chunk of their room inside the house, and we'll go that way. You know, but right now, we're not.